please welcome McKinsey partner Kirsten Heinecke. Good afternoon. Thank you for having me. Um, I'm going to be sharing a couple of the highlights from our most recent ACES survey. So, as many of the players in the mobility industry, we have our ACES framework, autonomous, connected, electric, and shared. Other companies have other frameworks. Daimler, for example, calls it CASE, but in the end, it's the same letters, just in a different order. What we do is, um, we've been doing this survey now for a couple of years. It's now in the sixth edition. We started in 2014. We ask more and more questions every single year. This year, last year, was around 70 questions. Uh, 7,000 people globally answer it. If I say globally, we have a couple of geographies. Uh, that we that we do cover and we always ask questions again around autonomous around connectivity around electric vehicles and also shared mobility and I'd like to walk you through a couple of the highlights um, this year for the first time we asked what actually makes people buy a car and what do you what do you actually think about when buying a car a couple of things are intuitive I think but I think what is, what is really exciting is that even private consumers, people who buy the car for their own private usage, they think about a concept that is called TCO, Total Cost of Ownership, that we have typically mostly only seen in commercial vehicles and in commercial applications. At the same time, other things that are also exciting is uh, brand image and reputation is, yes, somewhat important to some people, 16%, mostly in the premium space, but it's also not important to a ton of people. And at the same time, when we talk about ACES or CASE and when we talk about ADA systems or connectivity systems, this is, yes, a factor for some people, but the vast majority of people don't really care about these features in the cars. What they do care about is still performance and driving performance, um, the efficiency of the engine, and, and that's the most important thing for everyone, highest safety standards. If we um, take a look into autonomous, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to go through the ACEs, starting with autonomous and then going into the other letters, is we do see that there is a strong push of consumers to say, yes, we want autonomous vehicles, we want our governments to make sure that autonomous driving is being made legal, with a certain difference across countries. So my home country, Germany, is not that positive, as you can see on that, uh, that right-hand side of the slide. And we do see a lot of positivity, especially in China and India with a couple of European countries also uh, being positive. And this, this, uh, this uh, as you can see on the right-hand side, this has been on the same level, so roughly two-thirds across the last editions of the survey. When we go further into autonomous and we ask additional questions, we also wonder, would you trade in your car for a fully autonomous vehicle? And the first message is, yes, there is some interest of some people to actually do that. But if you then ask them, okay, what would make you want to do that even if you don't really want to do that, the, the, the choice of uh, being able to actually have an autonomous vehicle that you can still drive yourself would actually convince a lot of people to still adopt autonomy. So this notion of having a vehicle that still has a steering wheel and that still has paddles where you can actually take over control if you want to is very important to a lot of the people we have asked in this survey. Um, now we're getting a bit more data heavy. I hope you can, uh, you can see it and don't worry, I'm not going to go through every single number here. Um, what we did do is we asked about different types of features for autonomous driving, what people are excited about. And what you can see is if you go top to bottom, the features, they get more complex and they get more sophisticated. But actually the uh, features which are probably also closer from a time perspective, things like ADA systems, things like a traffic jam pilot, but also a highway pilot. These are more, uh, more exciting to consumers and they actually have a preference to adopting them. Whereas the more complex you get, the further you get to a fully autonomous vehicle, their excitement goes down a bit. And if you then think about regional differences, so um, as we saw before, China and India are super positive about autonomy. And then depending on the country where you go, you also see huge differences in Europe. So Italy, for example, much more positive than Germany for many features, which is interesting because in the last years we always used Germany as a proxy for Europe, which sort of shows that this may not necessarily have been the smartest choice. Let's go into connectivity, the second one of the ACES letters. Uh, what we did ask here is, would you want to share data? And if so, with whom would you want to share data? And what you do see is, again, Japan, China, fairly, uh, fairly open towards sharing data. And then the question is, who would you trust more? So would you trust an OEM more to share your data with? Or would it be a smartphone manufacturer or a tech company, if you will? And you do see certain interesting patterns. So number one, China, uh, Japan, India, much more open to sharing data at all. 
And then secondly, on a global scale, you do see that consumers trust the smartphone manufacturers in some cases much more to get the data than OEMs. We didn't ask why that is the case, it's just an observation. It's a bit different in some countries like the US and like Germany, but in um, many of the markets that ne don't necessarily have um, such a long-standing automotive tradition and such a long, strong automotive industry, we do see a slightly different trend. One question we've been uh, asking since the beginning is, would you change your car for better connectivity? And are you more loyal to your car brand versus to your smartphone brand? And what's interesting is, it's actually gone down for the first time now, at least gone down significantly for the first time now, and there are still huge differences by country. So you can still see that in China, almost two-thirds of the consumers would be willing to actually change the car brand for better connectivity. If you do a drill down, that's actually highest among Chinese Audi customers for some reason. We, again, we didn't know why. It's not that Audi has particularly bad systems, but for some reasons among the Audi consumers, customers in China, it's even higher. It's cl closer to 70%. In the end, uh, what we do see is huge differences, but connectivity remains an important feature, at least for some customers, and especially in India and China. Going into the next letter, electrification. I'm pretty sure you've all sitting in an electric vehicle. Uh, what we do see is, if you ask people, do you want the vehicles? The answer is always positive. Do you want to pay more for it? It's always very negative, so people absolutely do not want to pay up. There's a couple of, uh, of people at the, the higher end of the market, and the, it's probably the, the uh, part of the market that has already bought a Tesla or has opted into a Rivian or has opted into a different vehicle, but um, the majority of the market is not willing to pay a premium. And given the fact that automotive companies are actually not necessarily making more money off of the electric vehicles than they are of, of regular vehicles, of conventional vehicles. This might pose a problem in the next couple of years, and I think we're going to see a couple of interesting measures of the industry to actually push those vehicles into the market. A bit more on electrification, again, very data heavy and sorry about that, but what you can see in the end is the purchase funnel, the consideration funnel from left to right, starting from awareness, familiarity, uh, serious consideration, and then concrete plan to purchase. And as you can see, it's going down left to right. It's going down for all of the different countries. And in the end, what you do see is the vast majority of people is already looking into electric vehicles when they come to the purchase decision, but they don't make the purchase. So in the end, the conversion rate is still fairly low. What we do think is, um, it's obviously normal because it's a new technology, but at the same time, what we also see is that maybe the dealer networks aren't yet up to speed on actually pushing out the, uh, the electric vehicles. Maybe the incentivization still has a, a chance to be improved, and there's lots of stuff that can be done. But in the end, people are already very much aware of electric vehicles. It's just a question of pushing them, making the next push to actually get to the transition and actually getting them to buy electric vehicles at scale. Last but not least, um, shared mobility. So we always come to the, or the main question we have is, is shared mobility going to replace car ownership? And are people going to stop owning cars and only going to use shared mobility? And the answer is, as always, it depends. So what you do see is, um, number one, the private vehicle and public transportation are still the most dominant modes of transport, and that it cuts across the, the geographies. There are some differences. Obviously, public transit is more used in Europe and Asia than it is in the US, and a couple of other things, but the private car is still the dominating mode of, mode of transport for most people in the industrial countries. Then. We take a look and we, we ask a question on would you give up car ownership and what would it take to actually uh, give up car ownership? And what you do see here is again a tendency, a strong openness in India and China towards actually uh, giving up your car and doing something else and going only shared mobility uh, or going only with an autonomous shared mobility service. And then what we also do ask is would it, would it have to be cheaper, would it have to be on the same price level? And as you, what you can see from the data is, uh, so yes, there is a certain openness towards trading in the car, but always provided it doesn't cost extra or it might even come cheaper. And that depends a bit on, on where the people are seated. A couple of other things that are, that are exciting, so people do uh, value cost as the most significant feature. Another one is pickup has to be guaranteed. So people who would like to trade in their car, who would be open to trade in their car, they would still want to have the guarantee of actually having a chance of getting from A to B, regardless of whether they own a car or they don't own a car. We took a look at what is happening today. So we asked people, if you hadn't taken shared mobility, how would you have gotten from A to B? And 
you do see that a lot of the trips that uh, are being made by shared mobility would have been made by the private vehicle, at least in the US. Um, however, there's also a ton of things that are cannibalizing taxi and other, other asset-based modes of transport. But what we do see is a lot of the um, shared mobility rides actually cannibalize some kind of greener mode, if you will. So they also eat into public transportation, they eat into biking, they eat into walking. And if you are a city planner, if you are looking at congestion uh, and, and, and at road planning, that's obviously an issue because it's putting more vehicles on the road and it's actually making uh, getting from A to B more painful for most of the people involved. We did the same for micromobility, so all of these e-scooters, the limes, birds and so on it, it you see uh, running around. Um, uh, we asked people, that's what you see on the left-hand side, would you actually prefer to go public transit or micromobility if both were the same cost? And in all of the countries across the globe, people would actually uh, prefer micromobility, shared micromobility over public transit for convenience reasons, but also because they are in their own vehicle, even though it is outside, they would still um, uh, prefer to, to use that. And then we did ask, what would you have done? Again, the question on cannibalization. What would you have done if shared mobility, shared micromobility didn't exist? And in the end, what we do see is private car, yes, is one of the main modes of transport that is being cannibalized, but we also do see it eating significantly into walking and into public transit. And again, from a city perspective, that's a question that needs to be answered and uh, where cities need to wa work together with the players to make sure that public transit is combined with this type of mode of transport, but is not being eaten up because in the end, then public transit becomes even less sustainable and you create other problems like congestion. Now, on the implications, again, hopefully not too small, but I'll walk you, I'll walk you through the key insights. So what we do see is, um, we do believe that Yes, autonomous vehicles are maybe a bit, uh, or people are a bit less enthusiastic around autonomy than they were one year ago and two years ago and three years ago. On the other hand, we do see a huge customer demand and we also do see a huge potential. So we would push companies to at least keep the current traction ongoing when it comes to development or maybe even speed up development because the market potential and consumer demand is simply so high. When it comes to connectivity, data monetization, we do see a sizable likelihood that it's not necessarily going to be the automotive industry winning this, simply because there is a trust of consumers to actually give the data to the tech companies, not necessarily to the OEMs, and they may also not yet have uh, shown to be the best owners of this type of business. And consumers still value better connectivity, so it is okay to keep pushing on this. On electrification, there's going to be major price pressure to actually get the vehicles into the market. If I take a look at Europe, where we do see these CO2 regulations where OEMs have to massively sell electric vehicles in order to not be penalized for not selling the vehicles, this is going to require a significant push with incentives, with better dealer training, but also other things. And um, if we take a look then at um, uh, shared mobility and also micromobility, we do believe this is going to be an even bigger market in the future. So most of the investment, all of the investment in that space is definitely justified in our mind. Consumers are actively asking for it. We need a better way of these companies working together with cities just to make city mobility more, um, uh, more successful and also uh, approach it from a more holistic perspective. But in the end, we do believe that this, is going to, uh, this, this can really revolutionize mobility, again, if all the stakeholders work together. Thank you so much for your, um, for your patience and for bearing with me on these busy slides. If you want more information, there's more on the McKinsey side, there's more on the uh, McKinsey Center for Future Mobility website. There's also a report coming up on this. Thank you so much.